for most of us, space evokes thoughts of two things which started in the 1960s, the Apollo program and the science fiction television series Star Trek. Every episode of Star Trek, the original series, began with Captain Kirk's unmistakable voice declaring, space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Her five-year mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man had gone before. Not to be outdone by Captain Kirk, when Neil Armstrong famously stepped foot on the moon in 1969, he uttered another powerful statement. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. The powerful words of Captain Kirk and Neil Armstrong evoke bold and enduring visions. And bold visions are the foundations of bold actions and progress. So, are we progressing toward these visions? Should we? progress toward these visions? Can we achieve these visions? Yes. I say yes to all three. We have been living and working toward these visions for decades. And thanks to quiet leaps forward in commercial pursuits, national interest, and the desire to explore, we are living a modified version of those visions today. We are leaping forward, not into the final frontier, but into the now frontier. Progress toward those bold visions have enabled us to live in an era of live HD shots from Ukraine, the ability to text anywhere we can see the sky, and lightning fast communications around the globe during a global pandemic. Efforts in space have given us the conveniences of Uber and DoorDash. Progress in space even helps you Netflix and chill. And generations of scientists and engineers have risen to the challenges of space, developing technologies which underpin artificial hearts, have helped us make new cancer drugs, and enable us to peer into the cosmos and understand the history of our universe. We have barely waded waist deep into the ocean that is space, and already all of our lives are enriched by space every day. This is the now frontier, and we are just getting started. Back when Apollo 11 launched, Neil Armstrong's rocket roared into the heavens, delivering him to the moon. For he and his colleagues, it was a lonely and dangerous journey, crammed into a small, government-designed and government-built spacecraft. Now, despite the dangers and the hardships of the Apollo program, we ultimately succeeded in putting 12 people on the moon. For the men that made those journeys where no man had gone before, they blazed a trail that we now follow and laid the foundation for things like the space shuttle and the International Space Station, an orbiting facility the size of a football field that people have been living on since 2000. Now just think about that for a second. That means that no one under the age of 21 has lived a day in their lives where people have not been continuously living and working in space. That is just amazing. And thanks to new rockets being developed and new space capsules being developed and entrepreneurs like myself finding new ways to explore space, we are just scratching the surface of what we will be able to do in the future. This is the now frontier, and we are just getting started. NASA's Artemis program, fittingly named for the sister of Apollo, is slated to open a new frontier and a new era of lunar exploration. Now, Artemis will take the first woman to the moon, and she will fly by the International Space Station where a community of her fellow astronauts will surely cheer her on. And she will not be one of 12. She will be one of thousands to take that journey. Artemis and the International Space Station are building a legacy of innovation, inclusion, and invitation for more people than ever before to explore and use space. A cornucopia of commercial entrepreneurial activity 
on and around the International Space Station is expanding how we use space. And those entrepreneurs and startups will be the catalyst to enable us to achieve the vision of people sustainably living and working in space. Now, in order to help us sustainably live in space, brilliant engineers have actually developed 3D printers that work off the face of the planet. I was fortunate enough to lead a company called Made in Space that pioneered that technology. Now, a 3D printer's ability to locally, quickly make the tool or fix you need, or help you repair part of your spacecraft, or even make a splint for a broken bone, makes it a game-changing technology for space missions, from low Earth orbit on out into the stars. But 3D printing in space's utility doesn't just stop there. We can deploy large-scale robotic 3D printers to the moon's surface so that we can live off the lunar land, as it were, by building landing pads and roads and even homes from locally sourced lunar regolith that's just basic moon dirt, creating places where rockets can take off and land just like airplanes do at your local airport. Now, this is great news because we are no longer going to visit we are going to stay. The bold visions of Captain Kirk and Neil Armstrong have inspired a new generation of entrepreneurs who are seeking to build their fortunes and build businesses in space. And space industrialization will define the next centuries of space activity. That is because the space environment has some truly unique properties that we don't have here on Earth, namely microgravity. And microgravity has enormous potential value to improve things like manufacturing, research, and medical science. And these are much more powerful motivators than national pride alone, because today our advancement is driven by commercial interests. Now, researchers are just beginning to scratch the surface of what space means for medical science. Multiple rounds of studying bone decalcification in space are leading to better treatments for osteoporosis on Earth. Studying changes in astronauts' eyesight on orbit is actually improving vision treatments on Earth. And as the cost to get to space and the cost to operate in space come down, that expands our opportunities to study the human body and organ tissue outside of the effects of gravity to the point where one day we will be seeing orbital research medical laboratories in space. Similarly, when you take gravity out of the manufacturing equation, significant improvements in material performance are possible. Research studying casting metal objects in space actually show that in some circumstances, there are fewer fracture-related defects that form in those parts compared to when we make those same parts on the Earth. This is because sometimes it's actually easier to mix metals and cast metals in zero gravity than it is under Earth's normal gravity. Research suggests that we can make improvements of 5 to 10% in metal fatigue life. What this means is that we can make stronger and better parts for things like power turbines and jet engines, where extending the operational life of those parts even just a little bit lowers the cost of operations and lowers the cost of those services for you and me. Space-made jet turbines powering your airplanes may one day lead to cheaper flights. Now, we all live in an era that has an insatiable desire for more and more bandwidth. Today, you're watching your football game, your baseball game, your soccer game in 4K while Zooming with your friends. Soon, it'll be 8K, and then probably 16K, and on and on and on. Now, research also suggests that we can actually improve the quality of optical fiber production by doing that manufacturing in space. My teams and others have studied manufacturing an exotic optical fiber called Zblan on orbit, which has great promise in producing a fiber that we can send a lot more data down and do it a lot more responsively. If you think AT&T fiber is fast now, just you wait. 
And this means that you can connect with your friends and your colleagues anywhere on the web faster than you can via the state of the art. Now, ZBLAN was actually originally formulated in the 1970s, but it's very, very difficult to produce large quantities of that fiber in unit gravity on the Earth due to undesirable mixing effects that occur and the formation of microcrystals in the actual structure of the fiber. But we manufacture that fiber in microgravity, we see that those undesirable effects are suppressed, giving us a pathway to produce this amazing high throughput optical fiber on orbit in mass for use here on Earth. Given our insatiable desire for more and more bandwidth, you can imagine orbital fa factories in space producing this optical fiber one day for use around the globe. Medical laboratories, foundries, optical fiber production facilities. These are just a few of the industries that we will see orbiting our planet one day, producing goods to enrich our lives here on Earth to enable better drug therapies, to enable our planes to fly further and more efficiently, and to provide better data connectivity from the now frontier. Star Trek is science fiction. Wonderful, amazing science fiction, but nonetheless just a vision of a potential future. Ultimately, and this is as someone who was raised on Captain Kirk, our achievements in the now frontier exceed those envisioned on that television program, and our potential is even greater. So perhaps we should modify Kirk's words to fit where we are going in space, the now frontier. These are the voyages of the people of Earth, our continuing mission to explore, utilize, and protect the solar system, to seek out new opportunities and to protect our human interest, to boldly go to the stars and flourish in commerce and intrinsic curiosity where no species has gone before. Because ultimately, there is no final frontier. In the endless ocean of space, there is always more possibility and more to explore. Thank you.